All right, so we're doing this uh, series, and I called it uh, Pilgrims. So the next pilgrim, if you would, the next pilgrim we're going to look at is Noah. We just last week looked at Enoch, talked about him a little bit, and, and how God, uh, uh, you know, he just walked with God, and then he was not. And now we're going to talk about Noah, and I'm calling him a pilgrim. This is, this is the one guy that actually did get on a ship. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Talk about the pilgrims going across. This guy actually did get on a ship, right? So it said there in, uh, in Hebrews 11, uh, let's look at verse 7 again. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. That's a nice long sentence, but very full. There's some really good stuff in that sentence. But it's such an interesting sentence that I thought, you know, you know, I remember in high school we used to diagram sentences. Let's see if I can remember how to diagram sentences. And I did a lousy job. So I asked my wife and, and my daughter uh, to look over that and correct me, and there were plenty of things to correct. But they <laughs> diagrammed the sentence for me. And anybody in, actually enjoy that in school, or you remember doing that, the diagramming sentences? Mm, crickets. <laughs> my wife did, but actually, I kind of enjoyed diagramming, but I just I get confused where to put different things and, and what have you. But really try to break that down. There's a lot being said in this verse right here, and, and it's one of those verses that preach really, it preaches really easy because there's a, there's a nice outline for you right there in the text, but it says, uh, again, by faith, Noah. All right, and so the title of the message is this, You've Been Served, and it's going to take me a minute to get there, but You've Been Served. Anybody ever, anybody familiar, I, I, I questioned my kids about that. I said, do you know what that means, like when someone says, You've Been Served? Sometimes you'll see it's a little bit been sensationalized on TV, and I looked into it to see do lawyers actually say that. About half of them say, yes, I do. Other of them say, you know, hey, here are some legal documents for you or whatever. But you've been served as when a lawyer uh, or somebody passing on that information, so they have to tell them, put that in their hand, and that's kind of like a verbal way of knowing, like, all right, you've got it now. You've been served. You've got the message. And then that means that now they have a responsibility to take care of what it is that they've been given. They have an obligation uh, to take care of it. And so the reason I use this particular title is because just like Noah, uh, you know, when God gives us an instruction or a warning, there's some things he expects us to do. We have to put that uh, into action. God sees us. Uh, he sees our faith. He gives us a job to do. He gives us something, uh, you know, a warning. You've been served. And then we're supposed to do it. And I think about a good cr contrast to that would be Jonah. You know, Jonah, he got his, his paper, his legal document handed to him. Said, you've been served. Here's what I want you to do. Take, take my word to Nineveh. And I just heard a message on that. I don't know if anybody listened to that uh, message on Jonah. Man, that was really good. Really good uh, message how Jonah, boy, he did not want to take the message that God gave him to, to, to take to, the, uh, the Nineveh, to Nineveh, and he wanted to run away. He wanted to do something opposite, which really never ends up very well. Okay? If God gives you a job to do and you want to run the other way, you're just running against the most powerful force, and you're not, that's not going to go well for you. But God gave Noah a job, and the Bible says you know, there's something that he did by faith, all right, and he goes, and, and, he, and, and here's what the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You've already got it memorized, I'm sure. So, for by grace are you saved through faith. Okay, by grace are you saved through faith. Look at Genesis 6 now. <clears throat> so, when we get to verse 9, it begins the story uh, or actually verse uh, 7 begins this story about the flood. And, and, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things, thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then it begins to tell uh, the story about Noah, but it says that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't that something? For by grace, he was saved through his, his faith, 
By grace, we're saved through faith, right? It's the, it's the grace of God, plus it's also faith. And so here's what it says uh, in 2 Peter 2, 5. You don't have to turn there, but it says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. And here's what it called him. It said he was a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So the first thing I want to point out is that God gave Noah a job to do. He gave him the instructions. And Noah, it says in uh, Hebrews, was moved with fear. He's moved with fear, and the fear caused him to do something, okay? It, 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 I don't know if, if, if you've ever heard this. You ever heard somebody say, like, fear is, you shouldn't motivate people with fear? Like, just love. Love is the best motivator. You ever heard anyone say that? And love is a good motivator. There's no doubt about it. But fear is a pretty good motivator, too. <laughs> you know? Wait till your dad gets home. Oh, no, man. Now I'm going <laughs> to. If you ever heard that, you might know uh, I don't want to get in trouble, right? Why? It, because it's fear, right? And if you do that, if you know the consequences that something bad's going to happen, that causes you to fear. Now, I've my whole life have heard people say, well, we should never fear God. When it says fear God, it's talking about like you should just have respect for his authority and his position and, and, and who he is. And, and, and I understand, yeah, I respect his authority to the point that, you know, everybody in the Bible, when they're face to face with God or even one of God's messengers, they fall flat on their face, right? Sometimes you even see where they tremble. You know, and, and uh, what is uh, Belteshazzar when he sees the writing on the wall and his knees knock? <laughs> Isn't that a picture, you know? Here's a guy that's trembling in fear. And fear is a great motivator. Uh, it causes you to want to get into action and do some things. And so the first point is this, that, Mo that Noah was moved with fear. Look at, again at Genesis 6, 6 and look at verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, I actually mentioned this verse, and I forgot, I forgot to get back to that, but I read 2 Peter 2, and in 2 Peter 2 tells us something about Noah that you don't really see in Genesis. And that is that he, didn't just, he wasn't just a carpenter that God said, you know, you need to build an ark, and you need to save your family. And so he just went to business building. But, but in Second Peter, it actually says that he was a preacher of righteousness. And I think that helps us understand that one of the things, whenever he was moved to fear, one of the things he did is probably tell everybody. You know, that, that there was obviously something that he's preaching. Well, what's he preaching? Well, any prophet always preached what God told him was going to happen. You know, and so you got Jude, uh, when we read Jude about, uh, about Enoch, what did he do? He's preaching, right? And, uh, and everybody preaches. Jonah was given a message that he was supposed to preach, but he obviously didn't have the proper fear of God and he ran away, but he ended up with the fear, right? But, uh, but he didn't have the fear of God. But so Noah is given this, not just this understanding that I'm going to destroy the world, so you better build an ark. But he understood the urgency that we've got to get out there and we've got to tell people that this is coming. And he was moved uh, to actually preach righteousness. Okay, so fear, the Bible tells us a lot about fear. Look at Psalm, uh, Psalm 111. Psalm 111. In the Bible, I'm going to take you through these three verses. I want you to look at them. I could quote them, they're very familiar, but look at Psalm 111. And look at verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. So you see right there that the beginning of, of, of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Look at Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise uh, wisdom and instruction. 
So, so the, it's the fear of the Lord that causes us to even, uh, you know, seek out wis wisdom, seek out knowledge. Proverbs 9, same thing. Proverbs chapter 9. And look at verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So you see, like to even come to like this understanding and trying to know God and who he is and just have wisdom and have knowledge to even have that, it's going to require some fear. Right. So the fear of, uh, is what moves us to even uh, come to the Lord in the first place. And so, again, some people will say, oh, it's all about love. Like if you're motivated by fear, like that's the wrong, wrong motivator. You have to be feared. Uh, I mean, you have, you have to come to God because you just love Him and all that. And, and this, we see that with soul winning as well. When we, when we lead someone to the Lord, you know, what did Jude say? Like, of some have compassion, make a difference. Others save with fear, right? Pulling them out of the fire. And so there's this idea that, yes, love, motivator. But sometimes that, love, that what that love is going to, is going, the end result of that is going to be fear. Talking about that this morning in Iola, we were talking about how, uh, and I think I've used the illustration here before as well, but when we're disciplining our children, trying to keep them from something, we do that because we love them. And, uh, but it's also leaving an impression on them that, hey, if you do wrong, you're going to be chastened. If you do wrong, it's going to cause you harm. You know, we discipline our children. I know Stevie's in the same boat. You discipline them when they're young, right? To the, so that whenever they get older, like they don't even, it's just kind of subconscious. They know like if I do something, you know, it's going to cause, <laughs> it's going to cause me, me harm. So like, you know, they're like two years old and they're getting little, little pats on the, on the behind or pinches or whatever. And, and they know that my behavior brings on this certain response. And, and it's going to cause, you know, it's going to cause this pain. And so they don't even realize it, but it's something that becomes a part of who they are, you know, whenever you just look at them and, you know, they, they, they start getting, getting into trouble or whatever. You just look at them like, you sure you want to do that? A little bell goes off in their head. They're like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> they begin to have this fear. And it's not like this fear. I mean, you know, kids still love their parents even whenever they discipline them. But there's something inside that says, hey, I know that associated with making this wrong decision, is something that's going to harm me. And, then, and so this all goes together. Having faith, right, uh, causes us to obey God, causes us to fear God. All of it's, in, it's, it's, it's interchanged. So we talked about uh, Enoch, and the Bible said that he walked with God, right? In Jude, it said that he had this testimony that he pleased God, or actually Hebrews says that. And, uh, and so you see walking with God is pleasing with God. Fearing God is the beginning of all that. All these things go together, but this is what we're talking about. Somebody who is actually a believer, somebody who actually has the faith, he has all those things. He has the fear, you know, he walks with God, obviously not perfect, people are going to mess up and all that, but you're saying this is the person that fears God. So now God sees our heart. God knows if we have that fear. He knows if we have that faith. And so what's he going to do? Now, to be saved, obviously, we're talking about a pretty small amount of faith it takes. You know, uh, the Bible says, talks about the faith, the size, the size of a mustard seed, right? I've talked to people about this before when they say, well, well, what if I don't have enough faith? How do I know, like, how much I have to believe in Jesus to be saved or whatever? No, coming to Jesus through faith is just simply a decision. It's a decision that I'm putting my faith in him. That's a very small amount of faith. But here's what happened. God sees where you are in your life. There are some Christians, they've been saved, you know, they, they, they'll take a step forward and they'll take like three steps backwards, you know, they'll take another step forward. And it seems like, man, they're not ever getting anywhere in their life. Well, guess what's going to happen? God sees their heart. He knows their, he knows their faith. It's a small amount of faith, right? And then he looks at somebody else who has a lot more faith and he says, this is the one that I'm going to give a job to. This is the one that I'm going to give a great task of uh, of saving his house and saving his wor saving the uh, the world basically, and uh, so this is what he did with Noah. It, now I want to point this out that okay, obviously uh, the building of the ark, the taking action, doing what God told him to do, 
This is faith demonstrated, okay? Faith put into action. So he has the faith, God tells him to do something, and he begins to do it. And the ark is a great picture of salvation. I use it for salvation all the time. They're in the ark. And, and just like we're, if we're in Christ, we're going to get through this world, you know, God shuts the door, we understand that, and we get, we get to heaven. I use that all the time. But really, think about this. In the Bible, a lot of times God uses something physical for a picture of that which is spiritual. Okay? Had, do I know for sure that everybody that died you know, in the flood, do I know for sure that they were all lost and on their way to hell? I don't know that. There could be some people that were alive during that time that were actually saved. Do I know that everybody that got into the ark, in the, you know, I'm talking about in the actual story, the picture of salvation, I understand, but illustrations always fall short. But in the, in the actual building of the ark, do I know that everybody inside that ark was saved? No, in fact, I think there's good reason to believe that at least one person in that ark wasn't saved, right? The, 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 the things that Ham did, and the indications as to what he did, and we don't even know exactly what went on, but then the punishment that came with that and everything kind of make you think, I don't think he was ever one of God's people, right? So, so there's that idea that that, that that didn't even happen. So some people take this way too far with the ark. And, and I don't know if you ever saw this, but there's this thing that, man, so many people I know were sharing this on Facebook. And they're sharing this meme, and it was a picture of Noah and the ark. And I heard it put a couple different ways. Some people tried to change it because they didn't like the way that it sounded. But I think the original one said this. It said, grace didn't save Noah, obedience saved Noah. Okay, Grace didn't save Noah, obedience saved Noah. And you're all trying to think, like, well, how does that play out? Is that right? Or <laughs> so the idea is, and I understand what they're saying, like it's, the grace of God is, extends toward all mankind, right? But, but they have to actually receive, receive him for that. But that's not really what it sounds like they're saying. A lot of times it sounds like they're saying, hey, he had to actually build the ark. He had to actually do work. And so that that's, now that falls short when we're talking about salvation, Okay, because salvation is uh, coming to the Lord by faith, right? Now, yes, faith will move us into action, but but people get all bent out of shape and, and they make that to say something that that it was never intended to intended to say. But the ark is indeed a great picture of salvation. But the Bible says this. Look at John chapter three. <clears throat> John chapter three. That not only did Noah, was Noah moved with fear, okay, by faith, his faith caused these uh, certain actions to ensue, okay? Number one, he moved with fear. Number two, that fear caused him to do something, and what did he do? He prepared, prepared the ark, right? But the Bible says this in uh, John three seventeen through 18. The next thing he did, according to Hebrews, was that he condemned the world, okay? He condemned the world. John 3, 17 and 18 says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world, that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Rejecting the truth is what condemns people. Am I right? Okay, so when it comes to salvation... You know, rejecting the gospel, rejecting the, the simple plan of salvation, that's what condemns somebody. They rejected it. It's not their sins. Now, now the sins, ultimately, yes, we, we must, we, the, the wages of sin is death, okay? We understand that. All of sin comes short of the glory of God, therefore we must die. We must have the second death. We understand that. But ultimately, God's already paid for that. Through Jesus, by giving the gift, Jesus Christ died on the cross, he's already paid for the sins in the whole world. So ultimately, what is keeping people from getting saved is that they reject that free gift of salvation. Okay, so what's that got to do with condemning the world? Well, every time we give the gospel to somebody and they reject, they're actually being condemned. All right? Every time we tell somebody the truth and they don't want to receive it, they're actually condemning themselves. All right? And it's not just saved. Okay, I'm, I'm, that, when we talk about spiritually being saved, that's the case. But even for somebody who is saved, we're talking about physically. Man, if you do that, 
Here's what the Bible says. You're going to destroy your life. It's going to mess you up. You're going to be a bad testimony and all these kinds of things. And if they reject that teaching of the Bible and they go down that road and it destroys their life, it's their, their fault because they condemn themselves by rejecting that which was preached. And so by faith, the Bible says that Noah actually condemned the world. He was actually preaching to everybody. And he's saying, hey, God said he's going to destroy this world by rain. And I'm, I'm guessing that they just laughed at him and they mocked at him. And he's saying, man, you could come be saved. All you got to do is get on this boat and you'll be saved. And nobody did it. Right? <laughs> they, get, they condemned themselves. Right. But it was in a manner of, in one on one hand, he was condemning them by the preaching, preparing this ark, all the things. And then they rejected that. And therefore, you know, he condemned them. Now, we, we go out, man, obviously, they're already condemned if they don't believe. But do you ever feel almost like guilty? Like, I don't remember who I was with, but we were, we were knocking on doors. And, and the guy, uh, it was just, it was almost like, man, that was his last. Well, I know it was Brother Justin. And he was talking to an atheist. And uh, the guy was like, I just don't believe that. And so Brother Justin took him and said, you know, well, could I just show you what it is? Do you even know what Christians believe? And he's like, yeah, you can show me. So I went through the entire gospel plan, and the guy was saying, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense. He says, so do you believe that Jesus did that? And the guy said, nope, I don't believe it. And we walked away that place almost thinking, like, you know what? If he was like, he wasn't reprobate before that, and what if that moment was like the last time he rejected Christ, and God's going to just give him over, mess up his mind where he will never receive Christ? Who knows what's going to happen to him after that? You ever feel almost like responsible for that? <laughs> I mean, he's already condemned. I mean, he's already condemned because he didn't believe. But you feel like, man, God just used me to that one last time, you know, give them the truth, and they rejected it. It really should, sor it may, should make us sorrow, man. All these people are, are, are dying, going to hell, and... And, uh, you know, that's what I talked about a lot this morning uh, in Iola. It's actually, love. I preached on, Eph uh, on Eph uh, the church at Ephesus from Re Revelation 2. And, uh, you know, when it talks about doing the first love, you know, doing the first works, and it says you left your first love. And so what is, what is exactly that mean? If you, if you study the origins of, e of Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, and the, the work that, that Paul did laboring among them and teaching them, basically they got fired up. And they're doing what Paul taught them to do. They're loving the Lord. They're loving one another. And then they're loving people. And the, the, work, the, 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 the ministry is growing. Uh, Paul leaves. You know how Paul's ministry was. He'd set something up, then he'd leave. Later on, he'd come back and check on them and everything. And it seems like every time he checked on them, they're growing. Now all of a sudden you talk about he's meeting disciples and then he's meeting like, uh, uh, you know, he's calling all these elders together. Let me talk to all the elders. You get this idea that like while he's gone, they're growing and they're multiplying and they're, they're reaching people, right? They had this love. Most churches when they start, are they have a great desire to do the work God called them to do. And uh, I actually mentioned you guys and I said, you know, yesterday i just watching as 42 people are just crammed in this building at this little church. People drove their, the wheels off their car to get there, you know, <laughs> and they spent their gas money and they spent their time. Some people took time off work. Some people put all this effort into it. And I'm like, that's the way things ought to be. When the work starts and people are on fire for God, man, I love the Lord. I want to be there. And I'm watching as they're fellowshipping and they're loving one another and they're, they just can't get enough fellowship. They can't get enough, you know, feeding off of one another. And then they love the lost and they go out to the world and they preach the gospel and they're doing all this because they love the Lord. And almost every church starts out that way. Not every church, we realize, but almost every church starts out that way. And they're healthy and they're strong and they love the Lord. And then somewhere down the road, it's like it all becomes about programs and we got to make sure that everything's organized and everything's happening. And then they just kind of, the, the first love kind of starts to go away, you know. And it takes some time before they're not even doing anything. And, and, and the Lord said in Revelation 2, like, hey, it's just a matter of time before I just remove your candlestick, right? And unfortunately, there's a lot of old independent Baptist churches that did the work long ago, fire, on fire for God, warning people knocking on doors, giving the gospel to everybody that they could, unashamedly. And then years later, it's just like there's just nothing there. They're like, they're, they're, they're doing something completely different. But the Bible says that 
By faith, Noah prepared the ark, and by doing so, he condemned the world. But the best part of that, is, the best part of this is where it says this. The third thing that he did was he became an heir of righteousness. Let's look, read that again in Hebrews. So let me read the whole thing again. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things uh, not seen as yet, moved with fear. All right. So you have your faith. Uh, and the faith kind of moves him to fear, understanding who God is. He's got wisdom. He's got knowledge. He's got understanding. And now that faith moves him into action. He prepares an ark to the saving of his house. Right again. We're not talking about spiritual salvation. We're saying he physically saved them from the from the flood. So don't you can't take the analogy too far. Okay, physically saved him to his house, by the which he condemned the world, and then this last part, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So what exactly did he? What was he heir to? I mean, you know, obviously. His family's the only one left at that point after the, after the ark, you know, and so God's got to start, start with him. But man, you think about this, look at uh, Ezekiel 14. Aren't you glad you can't lose your salvation? Amen. Amen. We can't lose our salvation, but unfortunately, there are a lot of things we can lose. We can be saved, Amen. praise the Lord, but we can lose our testimony. We can lose many rewards that we would have otherwise had, but we didn't live for the Lord. We didn't follow him. We didn't fear him like we should. We did more like Noah. I mean, uh, more like Jonah instead of Noah, and we kind of run from him or, or live our own life contrary to him, and we begin losing all these rewards, and we begin losing our testimony. We begin, you know, maybe losing, people are losing their lives. People are dying going to hell because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. There's so much that we have to lose. Here it says that Noah became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Ezekiel 14, 14. I remember when we were, I was going through this study, this just kind of jumped out at me. And God's speaking to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is talking to the, uh, to the Jews of his day that are in captivity. Uh, and he's saying, hey, there's no hope for you. You're going to be destroyed. You know, only a remnant is even going to be re uh, remaining. And I won't get into it, but Ezekiel is quite a book. And here he says in verse 14, again, this is God speaking. He says, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. So here's what he's saying. Among all you guys, like if I looked at you and I saw Noah, and I saw Daniel, and I saw Job, and if you go study those out where those people are introduced the first time in the Bible, uh, the Bible talks about how these were righteous men, upright, you know, and, and, and even calls them perfect. You say, oh, nobody's perfect. Well, I guess it depends on how you define it because God called some people perfect. <laughs> and so they were perfect in God's eyes, right? And, and, and he said this about these three men. He said, I would save them because these are like the most righteous men I could think of to use at this time. <laughs> I would save these three men. Everybody else is going to be destroyed. And I got, I remember those names just kind of jumped out at me. And I was like, can you imagine, you know, in the millennial kingdom or, or, or all eternity? I don't know what happens after the millennial kingdom. So I just kind of get stuck right there. But in the millennial kingdom saying, you know, my name was in the book. You know, these all the most righteous men in the world. God lumps them into these Noah, Daniel and Job. Could you imagine being one of those guys and saying, God decided to put my name in the book. Now look, if you're saved, your name's in the book, <laughs> right? But can you imagine having those, that type of thing to say, this was a righteous man. Noah was a righteous man. Daniel was a righteous man. Job was a righteous man. And God was pleased by them. He was pleased by their faith. And, uh, and, and he, so there are going to be rewards, no doubt, in heaven for these guys that you can't even, you can't even understand. And now, obviously, there's guys in the New Testament. I think about the Apostle Paul. I can't imagine how many rewards he's going to have. And I think of uh, uh, just so, so many that we see in there. And you think, well, there you go, man. All you think about is just your rewards. 
yeah, well, that's a great motivator. <laughs> Just like fear's a great motivator. Hey, you know, you better act right or else, you know, when your father comes home, you're going to get a spanking. You know, and you're a little kid, that works because you don't want to get a spanking. But here's another thing that works. If you're good, when your daddy comes home, he's going to bring you an ice cream. That's a pretty good motivator too, <laughs> right? So, so we're motivated by fear, but another thing we're motivated by is one of these days we're going to stand before God and he's going to reward us according to our works done on this earth. I totally believe that. Whether they were good or bad, the things you did that amount to nothing in this life, worthless, they're all going to burn up. Only thing that's going to remain is what you did for Christ and the effort that you put into serving him and working for him. And so your faith, because of faith, you've got to make a decision. I do have faith in the Lord. By the way, he has, we have been served. He tells us what to do. He tells us how to live. He tells us what to do, the Great Commission, where to go and, and uh, go to the uttermost part of the world. And he's given us, we've been served. Now we've got to decide. You know, you're saved, you got faith, but now what are you going to do with that? Is that faith going to move you to fear? Okay, and is that fear going to move you to prepare your ark? Whatever your ark is that God has for you to build in this life, whatever that job is he's called you to do that's going to reach people and to be the most uh, uh, effective for his ministry, are you going to do that? And look, in doing that, listen to this part, are you prepared to condemn the world? So, well, I just don't think we should say anything, you know, uh, uh, offensive. I just don't like this uh, confrontational type stuff. Well, well, look, that's actually a good loving thing to do, confront somebody. <laughs> Again, I talked about that uh, this morning, and so uh, it, it ties in really well here. But if I really, really love somebody, you know, because the world will say, and I was, you know, I was talking about Catholicism this morning, and Catholicism is all about we got to feed the hungry, we got to do this, and it's just these kinds of works. And I'm thinking, man, you know, I could just sell everything I have and feed the poor, and they could still die and go to hell. Right. But the world would say, oh, the most righteous people are those guys that would give, you know, to the poor. Most righteous people are those who would, you know, that Mother Teresa and all these kind of people. They just lived and, and they gave so much to the world. And they give nothing to the world, right? Now, they condemned the world, but that's a, that's a, they, they helped the world that was already condemned go to hell, right? But the, what the Bible says that we should do is be loved, moved with compassion, with fear, knowing that these people are going to die and go to hell. And so it should cause us to want to uh, prepare our ark and thus condemn the world, meaning to some degree... You know, there are people, uh, here, here's another application to make out of that. There are some people in our life we're going to have to cut off. There are some people in our life, you know, we're just going to have to let them go because we are going this way, we're serving the Lord, and all those other people, you know, really they're being condemned. You know, they're, it's kind of like getting on the ark. The Lord shuts the door. You know, I can't imagine how terrible that would be to hear those people banging on the Ark, let me in. You know, this isn't, things aren't looking very good right now. And he's saying, man, I preached to you. I tried, right? And you wouldn't have anything to do with it. And so we've got to be moved with fear. We've got to prepare our ark. And here's the other thing that just keep motivated. If, if the fear, if you're not motivated by fear, if you're not motivated by the fact that souls are going to hell, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes that doesn't affect me like it should. I mean, really think about it. We all should be just crying about that thinking about loved ones that might die and go to hell, thinking about our neighbors. You know, I don't know if you ever just see a big crowd, and you can understand where the Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion, and he sees the crowd, and he sees the multitude, and he knows all things, right? So Jesus knows that most of those guys are going to hell. And you can see him just being moved to tears. And so often, I have to admit, in my life, I'm not really affected emotionally like I should. I'd probably be a much better soul winner if I was. Okay, but sometimes that's not. But thankfully, there is one other motivator, <laughs> that's the fact that I want rewards in heaven. You say, well, that's selfish. It's a motivator. It keeps me doing the work. I want rewards. <laughs> you know. But hopefully pray that the Lord will help me uh, have, a, have a more, more of a heart and a, and a desire you know, where, I'm, where I'm actually sad and I mourn over the, over the loss. But look, I want to look the Lord in the eyes and hear him say, well done. You know, I want to know that I, ha I left a testimony on this life that was clean. You know, if I die, uh, hopefully, I'm never going to have the situation where my kids are going to be like embarrassed.